The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to this new webinar organized by the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus of the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition in partnership with PATH, USAID, and the Global Health Supply Chain Project um, Procurement Supply Management PSM Project. Um, you are all muted in order to prevent background noise. My name is Milka Dinev, and I backstop the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus at the Coalition. This webinar is being recorded, and a link to the audio and video will be sent to all members of the caucus in a couple days. We're also hosting some of our colleagues of the Advocacy and Accountability Working Group, so you will all participants receive a link to the um, recording of this webinar. We will not open the microphone in order to avoid background noise, but you are most welcome to write your questions in the question box at the right window of your GoToMeeting platform. Um, our chair of the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus, Ms. Beth Yeager, will um, start the presentation and most of you know Beth. Beth is the maternal advisor at the PSM project. So Beth, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Milka. Good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone. I'm very pleased you could join us today to hear about some exciting work that the caucus has been engaged in. And hopefully we will get some of you so excited about it that your organizations will be able to take this on. Um, after the webinar. So just to set the stage, um, this work kind of all began at the in-person meeting of the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus that we had last June, um, when yet again we were discussing the problem of the poor quality of oxytocin in circulation in many countries, both in the public and the private sector, as evidenced by some studies that had been published recently. And then we were talking as well about the issue of the importance of cold storage of oxytocin and the fact that some manufacturers were labeling their product for storage at room temperature. And so some countries were thinking, okay, we will avoid the cold storage issue and procure that product. So we joked that we've been having the same conversation for decades, going back and forth about is it necessary, is it not necessary to store oxytocin in the cold? But it was true, it was an ongoing conversation. So basically in a moment of frustration and desire for clarity, um, the caucus members decided to review the evidence and come up with actionable public health recommendations on management of oxytocin that could be shared in countries for once and for all. So the USAID Global uh, Supply Chain Procurement and Supply Management Project Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition and PATH um, decided to facilitate this technical summit on oxytocin. We spent two days with experts from all different types of organizations, uh, UN agencies, um, other non-governmental organizations, universities, manufacturers, wholesalers, um, to discuss the evidence and come up with some basic messages. And at the end of these two days, the basic messages we came up with are basically the title of the framework you're going to hear about today. Buy good quality oxytocin and keep it cold. Now, almost a year after that technical summit, some of you may be thinking that this conversation is now irrelevant um, with the prospect of using carbitocin, a heat stable product for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. And while it's true that carbitocin is an excellent addition to our toolkit for postpartum hemorrhage, the fact of the matter remains that oxytocin is still out there now, and it's still gonna be out there for a while, and we really need to make sure that we're taking good care of it. And that's the purpose of this webinar. How can we, as a community, make sure people are indeed buying good quality oxytocin and keeping it cold? So following this technical summit, um, that I mentioned, it was clear that we needed to break down these tech technical recommendations into messages um, that were suited for specific audiences and stakeholders. And so the messaging framework was born. 
So Emma Stewart this morning, a policy and advocacy um, officer from PATH, is going to walk us through in a bit more detail the development of the framework, what it contains, and how we would really love for people to use it moving forward. And I would also like to give a very special shout out of appreciation to Bonnie Keith from PATH, who led both the facilita facilitation of the technical summit and the development of the messaging framework, and who is currently at home on maternity leave, taking care of her beautiful new bundle of joy. So if you happen to be listening, Bonnie, we love you and we hope you're doing well. And so with that, I will pass it over to Emma to talk to us about the messaging framework. Thank you. Thanks, Beth, and thanks for joining us. As Beth mentioned, my name is Emma Stewart and I'm a policy and advocacy officer at PATH and I'm here today on behalf of Bonnie. Um, so Beth mentioned a, a bit about this, but I wanted to start by providing an overview of both the activity itself and the presentation. So as Beth mentioned, the chairs of the Maternal Health Caucus, Supplies Caucus, excuse me, identified a need for common messaging around quality oxytocin to improve regulation, procurement, distribution, and use in partner countries. The focus of this work is on the public sector, but the hope is that the quality of oxytocin will also improve in the private sector via regulation and partnership. In order to do this effectively, recent evidence needed to be discussed with technical experts to ensure everyone was aware of the latest information and consensus was achieved on recommendations to be made. Maternal health advocates also needed to weigh in to ensure the messages would resonate with target audiences. The outcome is an advocacy messaging framework for use by all advocates interested in reducing the impact of postpartum hemorrhage. I'd like to start by talking a bit about the process. As Beth alluded to, in October 2017, USAID, the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus of RHSC, and Global Health Supply Chain PSM Project convened a group of scientists, researchers, manufacturers, and health experts from both the public and private sectors in Geneva to review current evidence on oxytocin and identify key public health messages to improve the avail availability of high quality oxytocin. Meeting contributors agreed to a set of recommendations that if followed, will ensure that high quality oxytocin is procured at all levels and will be protected throughout the supply chain. These recommendations centered around stewardship and accountability, procurement of quality assured oxytocin, and maintenance of oxytocin in the cold chain. One of the next steps from this consultation was to develop a messaging framework for future advocacy work, which is where I'll focus the bulk of this presentation. Following the technical consultation, GHSC PSM, the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus, and PATH brought together maternal health advocates, including those listed here, to craft messages based on the technical recommendations and consensus. This messaging workshop took place in Washington in November of 2017 and set out to translate the technical recommendations to high-level advocacy messages, prioritize and profile target audiences for a messaging framework on the management of quality oxytocin, and agree on key themes to incorporate in this messaging framework. Based on the inputs from both consultations, PATH worked to craft and validate key messages, soliciting input from participants from both the Geneva and DC meetings, as well as the broader Maternal Health Supplies Caucus. The advocacy messaging framework was launched in March of 2018. We often hear about evidence-based advocacy, but at times it's hard to know what this means. For us, this includes bringing together the technical know-how and advocates and communicators to translate the evidence into messaging in a deliberate way. As the at the technical consultation, experts reviewed oxytocin information across seven thematic areas. This type of rigorous review by the community is key to aligning on emerging and new evidence and generating technical consensus. But in order to make that information usable and user-friendly for advocates and the broader community, it is useful to distill the complex topics covered into more manageable content while maintaining the technical rigor. To do this for oxytocin, the group employed a message development approach that PATH has used in other technical areas, including menstrual health and total market approaches for family planning. 
This approach acknowledges the context in which we are communicating, one where there are many voices and many players, it's often a fast-paced environment with multiple audiences who have different information, wants, and needs when we're communicating about complex topics. This approach also helps devise strategies to overcome these barriers and break through some of the noise. Oftentimes, scientists and technical experts convey messages this way, providing detailed facts and analysis in the lead up to the main message. This makes sense as we are trained to be logical, complete, and accurate, and often fear being misunderstood or not making a clear or well-reasoned argument. However, we know from research that people take in information in chunks and in short bites, even more so today with social media and the way our media works. For effective advocacy, we have to shift to communicating the key points succinctly so they can be easily understood and remembered. In particular, for advocacy actions, we need to ensure that what is most remembered as we walk out the door or shake hands or leave the interview is the change or action that we're aiming for. To help get to the main and supporting messages, the messaging workshop group utilized the three frame approach, which considers these elements, the problem, solution, and call to action. So what is the outcome of all of these consultations. Leveraging the Geneva and DC meetings, PATH's advocacy messaging framework model was used to craft messages based on the consensus achieved in Geneva and affirmed with advocates. This resulted in the advocacy messaging framework, buy quality oxytocin, keep it cold, which hopefully you've seen before. This is a set of clear, action-oriented, evidence-based advocacy messages for use with both decision makers and influencers. What it is not is a summary of the evidence or a comprehensive review of the challenges. These messages are intended for use on their own or alongside evidence publications. How they're used will also depend on your stakeholder engagement and advocacy strategies, as well as what types of content best engages your particular target audience. The messaging framework is intended for use by the broader community of maternal and child health advocates. We use the term advocate here in the broad sense to include health practitioners, technical experts, government leaders, civil society, and community representatives who are concerned about women's health and well being. The framework includes core messages that can be used broadly as well as targeted messages aimed at these specific audiences maternal newborn child health program leaders, national regulatory authorities, public sector procurement agents, and supply chain managers. These audiences were prioritized with the Geneva meeting participants based on the decision makers and influencers who most need to engage with our recommendations and are best placed to take action to move the recommendations forward. Naming our target audiences helps us to focus our approach and our messages and develop a specific call to action that is fit for purpose and fit for audience. This helps us to be as persuasive as possible in achieving impact. Many of the messages also apply to other target audiences, so you're likely to find messaging that works for your strategies and audiences included in the framework. As I mentioned, the framework includes both core messages as well as targeted messages, which serve slightly different purposes. Core messages provide our foundation and our platform. They ensure consistency and cement a common language for partners, champions, and advocates. Targeted messages are tailored to the needs and interests of each key audience. They identify the right action for the right person to take in order to affect change. So let's take a look at some of the core messages, which are found on pages three and four of the advocacy messaging framework. You'll see that they speak to our three-frame approach of laying out the problem, solution, and call to action. I've chosen a subset of the core messages here. Postpartum hemorrhage, or PPH, or excessive bleeding after childbirth, is the leading cause of maternal mortality worldwide. Postpartum hemorrhage causes nearly one out of every five maternal deaths. Oxytocin is widely used, and governments have adopted WHO recommendations for its use to manage PPH. However, there is a high prevalence of low quality product resulting from poor manufacturing practices, limited regulatory oversight, 
and or inadequate transport and storage conditions, posing dangers to lives and health systems. So what is the solution? Postpartum hemorrhage can be prevented and treated using oxytocin, a highly effective first-line drug. Access to oxytocin could save 1.4 million lives over the next 10 years. Procuring only quality oxytocin is an effective strategy for saving lives, and like other successful maternal and child health initiatives, may result in cost savings. What should be done? Country governments should commit to only purchasing and distributing quality oxytocin. Because oxytocin degrades when exposed to prolonged heat, to ensure quality, it must remain in the cold chain consistently from the manufacturer to the end user. Thinking back to how people take in messages, we want to lead with the main message, but it's important to have supporting messages to back that up. You'll see some of those supporting messages for the call to action here, which are also found in the framework. Here is an example right from the framework that includes the targeted messages for national regulatory authorities. At the top of the screen, you see a description of the role this audience plays in ensuring access to quality oxytocin. On the left, we have the key messages for this audience, the NRA, and the gray box on the right has the specific call to action for national regulatory authorities. Each of the four audiences I described has a pri we, that we have prioritized has similar information found in the framework. So once we have these messages informed by our technical consultation, vetted by our advocacy experts, how should they be used? Starting last spring, the advocacy messaging framework has been disseminated by the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition and others like the Global Health Council and the MCH Roundtable Listserv. The messages have also been used by partners, including in Beth's March blog post, Saving Women During Childbirth Starts in a Surprising Place, the Refrigerator. They've also been promoted and shared via Twitter and other channels by the RHSC, PATH, and others. However, we know that advocacy is not an event, but a process. And despite the fact that the framework is published as a polished PDF, it is intended to be dynamic and utilized by the community in their own activities around postpartum hemorrhage in general and oxytocin specifically. As I mentioned earlier, a framework like this helps the community speak with one voice around a topic. We encourage you to use the messages in your own communications pieces by copying and pasting them into fact sheets, blog posts, presentations, or tailoring them for these purposes or meetings with your own key decision makers. So what comes next? Before we open up for questions that people have submitted, we wanted to solicit some feedback from this group as to how the messages can support your work. Either on your phone or another browser window, but be sure not to close the one you're watching the webinar on, um, please go to www.menti.com, as on the screen. And once you're there, you'll be asked to enter a code, and ours is 536043. I'm going to leave this up for a minute as people orient themselves and, and navigate to Menti. Um, but once you're there, we just have three questions for, for the group, and we'll be able to have some interactivity um, in responses. While people are connecting to Menti, um, I just wanted to mention, Emma, that we have the messaging framework in English, French, and Spanish, and you can find the document in the RHSC website under um, Working Groups, Maternal Health Supplies Caucus, and you will find the versions in the three languages. Great, thank you. So I'm going to switch my screen to Menti, and you'll see the first question there is, I can use these messages in my work, um, and we're looking at the responses on a scale from unlikely to definitely. Um, so if you've navigated to this on your phone. Definitely is going up. Yeah. <laughs> if you've navigated to this on your phone, hopefully you can see my screen, which shows the responses coming in. If you've done it in another tab um, in your browser, you might want to switch back uh, to 
to the screen to see where people are coming in. So we've got 12 responses and, and folks are leaning heavily on definitely being able to use the messages in their work. Um, it's heartening to see that no one finds it to be very unlikely that they'll use them. Um, and so the next question we wanted to ask was around audience. Um, and the audience that I'm most likely to communicate with about oxytocin is we have the four that I spoke about in the presentation, MNCH program leaders, national regulatory authorities, public sector procurement agents, supply chain managers, and the opportunity um, for other. And as you're thinking about this, if, if you're thinking of another audience, um, it would be great if you could just type in what that audience is in the chat box so that we can be thinking of who else might um, find these messages useful aside from those that we've already spoken about. So it looks like MNCH program leaders are a crowd favorite, um, followed by national regulatory authorities and supply chain managers. Great. So we have one last question for the group, which is open-ended. Um, and we're just curious to hear how you might intend to use these messages. So uh, for this question, you get to type your response uh, as an open-ended response. Um, if you have, I think you're able to answer more than once if you have more than one idea, but. Great. So to me, communicate with advocates and decision makers. Um, someone plans to use these messages every time they meet with government authorities, which is great. Um, communicate with MNCH programs and technical advisors. It's another great use. For me, what's useful about a framework like this is that a lot of the, the thinking has already been done and I'm able to adapt to use with different audiences and different purposes um, without having to kind of go back to the evidence base myself or start from scratch. And so um, some other ideas that people have are to push these out with project staff um, and have them share with in-country partners, um, to ad advocate for adequate oxytocin stock and effective supply chain with the government. Um, I think all of these are great examples of ways in which um, this common platform can help us meet with lots of different types of stakeholders, um, supply chain managers. We saw people are interested in talking to the National Regulatory Authority, MNCH program leaders. Um, great, someone's planning to print and distribute to local supply chain managers. Um, so lots of, lots of opportunities to use. And as Beth mentioned, um, we, this was launched last spring and we're talking about it now and, and it, it's not going out of style. And so we're hoping that people can take this, pick it up and run with it um, in their own context, in their own setting as appropriate. Um, if you are writing pieces about oxytocin or, or postpartum hemorrhage, it'd be great to reference some of the messages um, that have already been vetted by the group, um, share them with program managers and ministry officials, that kind of thing. But know that this is a resource rather than kind of a finished publication and so you can pull from it what you need at various times um, when you're engaging. And so thanks for helping us figure out kind of what the group is thinking. Um, I think now we can reflect on any questions that might have come in, if there are any. So let's give one minute to people to write their questions. Um, thank you very much, Emma. Very, very clear presentation and to the point, just like the document itself. Very, very clear, very useful and practical. And uh, we hope that this becomes a tool for our advocates out there and for program people. I think the messaging framework has been done in such a way that anybody can take those messages to 
um, local government authorities and supply chain managers. Um, so we're we're on that. Um, I don't see any questions coming in. Okay, there's one. Laura McGall is asking or is making a comment. The challenge is often at the health facility level when people say there is no refrigerator and they won't let oxytocin be stored in the same refrigerator as vaccines. Um, Laura, you might want to, to know that a couple years ago, UNICEF and WHO issued a joint statement whereby they encouraged health facilities and health providers to um, store jointly in the cold chain vaccines and other uh, temperature sensitive uh, drugs like oxytocin. So uh, if you want, you can send me an email and I can give you a copy of that um, joint statement. It was also translated into Spanish and French by the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus. So basically um, we, we can provide you with copies of that. Second question from Laura. So what is the message for the health facility? Yeah, I think the message for the health facility is that uh, quality oxytocin needs to be kept cold until given to a patient. And so as Milka just mentioned, there is some normative guidance around this, um, but I think it's really raising awareness among health facility staff that um, oxytocin does need to be kept cold in order to maintain its efficacy, um, and then working with them to determine what the barriers might be. Um, if it's a lack of understanding of that guidance, that's one thing. If it's working with the, the cold chain, um, the EPI and others to ensure that um, that's well understood, that might be a next step. But I think um, from our perspective, the, the first thing would be making sure that there was an awareness that oxytocin does need to be, is temperature sensitive and needs to be kept cold. So Beth, you wanted to make- I can just, yes, please. Um, those are both excellent points, Laura, and indeed this is not gonna be easy. So part of the, the discussions around the summit and then the development of this messaging framework is that this needs to be accompanied with practical actions at the country level. So one thing is to make sure this, these messages get out there um, and that there is an understanding that this is the case. And then the next part, which is potentially the most complicated part, is how do you implement this? How do you operationalize this? And so on the PSM project, we're working in a number of countries to figure out what to do. Um, and I will also mention that the caucus, one of the caucus members, MSH, has an innovation fund this year to look at this issue as well. Um, and maybe I know Jane Briggs is on the call, so perhaps she can um, comment on that in the text box. But I think this is a very important point. The messages need to get out there, but they also need to be accompanied by action, and it's not going to be easy. And that's where we as a caucus would like to move forward this next year. Make sure that we are getting the messages out there, but also coming up with practical solutions to operationalize these messages. Thanks. And I'm mentioning Jane Briggs from MSH. Um, Jane just wrote uh, a little comment here. Um, uh, indeed, uh, MSH is working under the Innovation uh, Fund of the RHSC on exploring the integration of oxytocin in the vaccine cold chain. And um, MSH will be with the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus next week in our in-person meeting here in Washington, D.C., where they will provide an update of their work. Then we have a, a question from Mohamed Sila from Mali. Is it possible to get the presentation because it's so clear and useful? Yes, Mohamed, you will receive a link uh, tomorrow at the latest with um, a recording in our YouTube channel of the presentation and the PowerPoint. So you will get that, um, I, I imagine, by tomorrow. Um, you can also get the full document in the RHSC website 
en français aussi. So it's English, French and Spanish for all of your needs. Um, Sharif Hussein has a question. Why don't we advocate it to the regulatory authorities? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, sometimes we think of the targets of our audience as the people we interface with the most. And so we saw a lot of people interested in communicating with MNCH program leaders. But for something like um, cold chain storage and other drugs, we sometimes need to take these messages to the NRA or the National Regulatory Authority. And I think um, that came out clearly from the Geneva consultation, that that's one of the groups that's most well positioned to take this um, to take this work forward. Um, and so that is one of the key audiences that's laid out in the document um, with some key actions for what the NRA specifically can do um, to ensure quality oxytocin throughout the supply chain. So I think it's a the point well taken is that there are lots of different players. And for me, what's useful about this framework is the um, evidence is tailored to each of those audiences with a specific call to action. Um, so the broad call to action is buy quality oxytocin, keep it cold, and then folks might say, how do I do that? And for each of those key audiences, um, we have some, some specific actions that they can take in order to ensure um, quality is maintained. We, we have had problems with the labeling of oxytocin as well. There are some manufacturers that are um, labeling their oxytocin as temperature stable. However, if you read the very, very fine print in the insert, it will say uh, temperature stable as long as it's 25 cell or 21 Celsius over six months. So in most of our countries, we don't get six months of 21 Celsius uh, on the shelf. And most of our countries um, have very hot temperatures. So um, they can go up to 30, 35. Sometimes uh, they're in warehouses where temperatures can go up to 40. And um, if you read the fine print, you will discover that there is absolutely no uh, temperature stable oxytocin so um, but yeah you will find very precise uh, message message for the regulatory authority so Jane Briggs is asking a question what work is being done to coordinate with the supply chain design work that UNICEF and Gabby the inclusion of oxytocin in the vaccine cold chain would be an important part of that. Beth, I don't know if you have additional thoughts on this. I know that um, EPI managers were included in the Geneva workshop, or at least one that I know of, and, mm -hmm. and thinking through that critically about how this is best um, realized. And I think this guidance is also, this messaging is also useful in communicating with Gabby and UNICEF and others who in many countries um, are the overseers of the cold chain. And so I think there's some work that's happening. I don't know if it's at the um, normative level, aside from that joint statement that Milka mentioned um, in terms of how countries can operationalize this. But Beth, if you have additional insights into that, they're most welcome. Sure, thank you. No, I think that work is happening more at the country level. Um, and so as countries are moving forward with these conversations and um, evaluating the potential to integrate oxytocin in the EPI cold chain, then they're pulling in um, Gavi and UNICEF to those discussions. Um, UNICEF and Gavi have been aware of um, what we've been up to and have indeed been engaged in these conversations. But I think, uh, again, this is more the operationalization of these messages is going to happen more at the country level, and that's where those stakeholders will need to be pulled into conversation. Sharif Hussein has um, another question. As manufacturers could be misguiding people, why don't we advocate to the pharmaceutical companies? So I wasn't part of the, the group that did that selected down to these target audiences. I think we um, expect as countries continue to build their 
regulatory authority, that that would come from the national regulatory authority, that they would be um, the ones who would communicate the requirements to manufacturers. And so as we have limited resources and limited manpower to move this forward, really targeting um, the correct decision makers might be easier. And one way is using those gatekeepers of the national regulatory authority to be the ones who communicate further up the pharmaceutical supply chain. Yeah, Emma, if I can just add to that, I think you're absolutely right. I think the suppliers will do whatever the market wants them to do. And so I think as we were developing the framework, we were focused more on the in-country stakeholders, national regulatory authorities, procurement um, agents, um, because once they are insisting on certain quality specifications, then the manufacturers will have to respond to that. And so it's, it's making manufacturers aware that this is coming, but the heavy lift is going to be, again, ensuring that these products are requested for procurement. Um, I think this is all um, about on questions. Uh, I don't see any more questions coming in. Great. So thank you so much for attending this webinar. Beth, as the chair of the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus, would you like to say the final words? Uh, sure. So thanks very much again for um, your interest in this topic. As Melka mentioned, the messaging framework is posted on the RHSC website. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact Emma or Melka or myself. And hopefully we will continue to work on this issue. And um, again, as Milk I think, mentioned, we're having a meeting of the caucus next week, and we'll be discussing this. So please, if you have any additional questions, concerns, or interest, please let us know. Thanks very much. With that, we will close our webinar platform. Goodbye. <laughs>